Welcome back everybody. We're going to get into the Swedish K submachine gun today. This has been a firearm that's been talked about in the comments of a couple of different videos. Obviously we've been looking at the Swedish Cold War situation and everything surrounding that. This is one of the things that's come up. I've been interested in giving it a look, especially when I've gotten comments about it, but I wanted to hold off so that I could do it on the channel. So that's what we're going to look at today. I'm hoping to get a another video out later. Epic History just released a Napoleon in Italy video. And since France won today against England in their World Cup match, I decided that I was going to go with something French. So I'm hoping that that will be out later today. At the latest, it should be out tomorrow morning, depending on how long it takes to edit. But we'll see. But with that being said, let's jump into it. The Swedish K. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at Movie Armaments Group up in Toronto where we are taking a look at the famous Swedish K. And we're also taking a look at the not-so-famous Egyptian Port Said, which is a licensed exact copy of the Swedish K. Although what's interesting is it's a copy of the early version of the Swedish K and thus slightly different and gives us a really cool insight into how this gun actually started. So, uh, a little bit of background here. Sweden did have submachine guns going into World War II, but they didn't have a whole lot. Their first one was the model of 1937, which was basically a license-built Suomi in 9x20 Browning Wong, uh, which, because the round was semi-rimmed, the 9 Browning round, had this interesting magazine that was actually tilted backwards to ensure that the rims didn't uh, stack up and cause rim lock. At any rate, the Swedes had like 900 of them, not, not a whole lot. They augmented that uh, in 1939 with a batch of 1800 Bergman MP35s that they bought from Germany. Just for context, if you ever see R at the end of the a type of ammunition, that's what it's referencing is, is rimmed. Germany. Uh, they then made some more improvements uh, in at about that same time period. They could see war was coming, or by 1939, war was happening. Uh, war were declared, as they say. And they went back and they updated and modified some of their Suomis to, uh, to chamber them for 9mm Parabellum, uh, and that was the 37-39. They, in 1940, they acquired a bunch of Thompson guns, I think 500 1928 Thompsons from the United States. And so by this point, they have this real just smorgasbord of different submachine guns. And by 1944, they decided, first off, they needed more submachine guns. And secondly, they wanted like something standardized. You know, can we combine all of this mess of different things into just one gun? And this is, you see this a lot in World War II and on the back end of World War II. A lot of countries have kind of just gathered a bunch of different types of, of firearms from a bunch of different countries. And they most of these firearms work fine. But what happens is you, you just have a whole slew of a bunch of different stuff, not very uniform, not very easy to maintain, keep ammo, you know, stocked away, things of that nature. It would be much easier if you had one type of rifle, one type of submachine gun, you know, just a uniform thing across the board. So it's not just Sweden. This is happening in a lot of places around the world at around the same time. So uh, in 1944, they held official trials and two different factories submitted submachine guns to the trials. One was Carl Gustav and the other was Husqvarna. In the end, the Carl Gustav gun won and it looks a little cleaner. The Hus I don't know much about the Husqvarna gun. Uh, it looks lumpy and weird from the outside. A lot of weird projections coming off of it. I suspect it was mechanically very similar. I've got to be honest. I, I own a landscaping company. That's what I do for work, like actual work. This is, I I've talked about this in the comments before, but this is the most non-work, work-related thing that I've ever done in my life. But anyway, I own a landscaping company and Husvarna is just, I, I just can't in my head not think about lawn equipment. It just, I, every time it's said, every time it's talked about, my brain just immediately, immediately goes 
to lawn equipment. So just kind of a sidebar, but every time I hear it in reference to something different, especially firearms, I'm like, wait, what the hell is going on? Just, just a little side note there. The Carl Gustav gun is an extremely simple open bolt blowback tube receiver type of submachine gun. And it's exactly the sort of thing that World War II proved was a perfectly adequate, takes care of everything sort of general purpose submachine gun. So the gun went into production in 1945 and, uh, and, and there would then be subsequent extra versions, the models uh, 45, B, C, and D. But uh, we should take a look at how they work. Although first, let me answer one thing. This is called a Swedish K. And it's not because it was made by Carl Gustav, because Carl in Carl Gustav starts with a C. This was actually called the Swedish K because in Swedish, the designation was Kulspruta Pistol. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it's spelled with a K, which translates into submachine gun, Kulspruta Pistol M45. And a lot of people who don't speak Swedish just shorten that into, ah, it's Swedish, it's that K thing, it's the Swedish K. So that's where the name came from. Now, that's actually kind of hilarious. Now, let's take a look at how they work. In Swedish inventory, most of these guns were updated to the M45B configuration, which involved a couple of changes. They strengthened the rear end cap on the receiver, and they fixed the magazine well in place, because by this point, uh, the guns were only intended to use one magazine, and that was the 36-round double-stack, double-feed magazine that was designed by the Swedes in 1945. Uh, this came into use just shortly after this gun was trialed and adopted. And this is an excellent magazine. You'll notice it is, it's not, uh, the sides aren't parallel. This gives the cartridges a little bit of wiggle room, uh, gives dirt and debris a place to go, and generally makes the gun, the magazine, more reliable. It is nice and easy to load. It's reliable. It's strong. It's a really good magazine. Before this, however... Yeah, it looks exactly like the the magazine you would have for a, a regular pistol handgun something like that obviously extended but it's the same general look uh, the swedes actually designed the gun to use suomi magazines primarily the 50 round coffin mags although they did also have that's what i was going to ask was do they have something that holds more rounds drums because of course the swedes had a bunch of suomis in their inventory they've been using these uh, in World War II, uh, the 3739 Suomis, and they had the magazines, they're high capacity mag, they're in the right caliber, so uh, the trials guns, both from Carl Gustav and Husqvarna in 44, were both designed around these guys. When this magazine came into use, they designed a magazine well adapter that would fit it. Uh, originally they were removable, and we'll take a look at the removable type on the, uh, on the Port Said copy, because it still has it. But before we do that, we can take a look at the markings here. We have a Crown C, Swedish military uh, property mark or proof mark, and the serial number. That made in Sweden, I suspect, is aftermarket to bring the gun into the United States. Other than serial numbers on a few parts, that's it for markings on the gun. Uh, these have a pretty heavy duty folding stock that is held in place back here. When it's folded, this is just held under light spring tension like a detent, and all you have to do is lift the stock up to pop it open. Once you open the stock all the way, it locks in place by way of, well, with this latch. So this has actually just a tiny bit of wobble, but it's quite a strong lockup system. In order to close the stock, you have to compress this spring by squeezing the stock together. And you can't do that unless you push this lever back because this lever right here acts as a lock to prevent the stock from folding. So if you push that lever and then squeeze the stock, then you can fold it back up. The M45 is a full auto only gun, so there's no selector switch. There is also no safety lever on the gun. The safety is actually this hole. When the bolt is forward, you can push the bolt handle in and that will push that pin into this hole, which means you can no longer open the bolt. That's going to prevent it. Obviously, when the bolt's forward, it's prevented from firing. That prevents the bolt from bouncing open and uh, firing inadvertently. Once you pull this open, you can cock the gun. At this point, uh, the safety doesn't do anything. 
you can push it in, but it's not going to prevent you from closing the bolt. Yeah, obviously it's it's there to keep the bolt from coming back. Once you pull the bolt back, it's not going to do anything. But I thought they were going to say that it didn't have a safety. So, uh, you know, that at least they had a safety thrown in there. If you want the gun uh, safe while the bolt is open, you lift it up into that extra notch. For sights, you have a three position rear notch to choose from. So one, two, and three. The front sight is adjustable, so you can thread it in and out for elevation. And note that the front post is not exactly centered in that whole front sight piece. So to adjust your windage, you actually rotate the sight uh, left or right. Um, that in theory impacts your elevation slightly, but not so much to really make a difference on an open bolt nine millimeter submachine gun. Rate of fire on these is actually fairly low, about 600 rounds a minute. That's one of the things that people liked about them. They were a quite controllable gun. It's also a relatively heavy gun. And personally, my one complaint about the handling really is the front to back width of this grip. Uh, to me, it's uncomfortably large. I think they could have cut this off by like half an inch and had something much more comfortable. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it's, you know, it's hard to gauge the size of somebody's hands, but as he kept messing with it, it looked like it was, <coughs> it was big in his hands. Um, I wonder how heavy it is because he said it's it's relatively heavy and it really doesn't look like it would be so I'm I'm curious how heavy it is obviously the you know it being relatively heavy is in comparison to similar type firearms but I'm just curious exactly how heavy it is uh, it may have been designed for like giant hands of a race of Swedish ice Vikings but uh, <laughs> for normal people or at least for me it's a bit large Disassembly is really easy. We're going to push this center pin in, and then we can rotate the end cap around, and then it comes off. The recoil spring comes out, and then the bolt comes out. That's it for the back end of the gun. On the front end, the barrel jacket and barrel are removable. This is the barrel nut here. That, the back end of that, is easier to take apart than um, I have a Smith and Wesson nine millimeter. It's a, a shield. It's it's small and co concealable basically. Um, that back end was easier to take apart than my shield is for sure. A thousand percent. That was faster. And there is a little spring detent right there that we have to hold down. So, and then we can unscrew a little farther. All right, then we can unscrew the barrel nut. Then the barrel jacket comes off, the barrel comes out, and that's it for field stripping. So there you go, there's a field stripped M45B. The bolt is just a single large block of metal with an extractor in it. Uh, the firing pin is fixed in the bolt face, so it's extremely simple. There's really nothing fancy going on in here at all. I love old how old firearms are made. They're really, really incredible to me because of how just plain and simple and like totally based on physics they are. I just, I just love them. There were a couple other versions of the gun. There was an uh, an M45C, which had a barrel jacket with a bayonet, and that was used like for guys on guard duty. Uh, the bayonet that they fitted to this was the uh, the carbine bayonet, which was extra long to make up for the carbine, the, the Swedish Mauser carbines. Okay, you know that I love you Swedes to death. That is the goofiest looking shit I've ever seen in my life, and that is a full-on sword at the end of that gun. That is wild looking. And on the end of a submachine gun, that is, I'm, I'm just, let's keep going. Short barrel. So the bayonet on this thing was like 18 inches long. <laughs> yeah. I suppose actually made it sort of a viable tool for a guy on guard duty. There was also the M45D, which had a selector switch on the, on the receiver. So it could be set to either semi-auto or full auto. 
but by far the, the most used standard configuration was M45B, which is what you see here. No doubt you could fish with that thing and never get the barrel of the gun wet. Well, the Swedes liked their fancy painted green guns to blend into the forest. The Egyptians weren't so fancy. So this was, uh, was licensed by Egypt in, the date's unclear, either late 40s or early 50s. Uh, definitely by 1952 they had it. Uh, and the gun is, it was set up with Swedish technical assistance and obviously the, a technical package from the Swedes because the gun is just identical. The markings are of course slightly different and I believe this is Arabic for Port Said, uh, maybe nine millimeter, something along the lines of the model name, Port Said. In fact, probably pretty close to the same, to the translation of the markings here on the right side, Port Said, nine millimeter made in Egypt. And all of the numbers on here are numbered in Arabic, along with an Egyptian uh, military crest up there. Now there are two differences that we can see uh, that are changes from the M45 to the later M45B. One of them is this end cap, which on the Egyptian gun is just a plain round cap. On the Swedish B pattern, they really reinforced it. They added this hook, which had a matching lug on the receiver. They added this bottom lug. Apparently they had issues with the, the strength of the receiver end caps because they put a lot of energy into increasing that. So that's one change. The other change is up here at the magazine well. So this gun is also set up to use the same 36 round double stack magazine. Although I will point out, if you look here, uh, the, this is a Port Said magazine and the witness holes are numbered in Arabic. The magazine is numbered in Arabic and we have an Egyptian uh, proof mark on there as well. But we can see the original magwell design that the Swedes designed for using Suomi Max. So on this one, there is this metal bar that comes across and I can actually push that out. I should be able to. There we go. That comes out and then the magazine well comes off. So this is the way the Swedish guns originally were. When they decided that they were going to stick with just that 36 round mag, they started prim uh, permanently pinning these in place. Pins coming through from that side and rounded over on this side like rivets. The Egyptian. Interesting. So that's for the initial magazine. That's just gone. There's, there's nothing else there. It's just gone. I'm looking at the cutout there. I, I guess I could see it working that way. But for some reason in my head, I had, I had there being a replacement. Like, okay, you take that cover off, but then you put a different one on. Not just pull it off and then that's it now. Never, ...never bothered to make that change. And what it means is that a Port Said can actually still fit a Suomi coffin mag. It's a little... A little sticky here but yeah there you go i yeah for some reason in my head i anticipated there being some other cover there but it just it slides right in that thing now you've got a 50 round magazine in there and it will also uh, take the suomi 71 71 round drums as well so that's pretty beautiful cool. other than those two changes the port said is identical to the m45 uh, all the internals are the same. It works exactly the same way. So we're not going to bother taking that one apart. So it was the... Okay, so somebody explained to me why that was done. The, the Swedes later model wasn't capable of taking magazines with more round capacity like the, the older version was. Why? It just, it wasn't needed. They figured that, like they had had the earlier version... They were using the, the 36 round clips fine. And so they just decided, okay, well, we'll just stick with this. I'm just curious what the thought process is there to like cut out the ability or what they think. We'll just make a different magazine. If, if push comes to shove and we have to have a, a higher round capacity, we'll just make a new magazine. What's, what's the thought process? Late 40s or early 50s when uh, Egypt licensed the design and they uh, actually had Swedish engineers come over and help them set up the, the tooling to produce these guns and as a result they are strict perfect copies of the Swedish M45. 
Uh, this would then also end up being used by U.S. forces in Vietnam. Uh, the U.S. Navy, specifically the SEALs, acquired the, the Carl Gustav as a, a good option for a deniable submachine gun, something that fired 9mm that wasn't directly tied to the United States. Uh, they liked the fact that it had a nice solid folding stock, so it could be compact, but didn't wobble and was easy to shoot when it was open. And one of the other things they liked was that the front uh, barrel assembly was easily removable, and uh, the U.S. military actually built a, an integral silenced barrel assembly for the Carl Gustav, and that's some of what they used in Vietnam. Not all of them, of course, but uh, eventually, once the Vietnam War heated up, the Swedish government stopped allowing sales to the U.S. government because they were being used in a war. And so the U.S. Navy, the SEALs, had to look elsewhere for their 9mm submachine guns, and that's what led to the Smith & Wesson M76, which we have a video on, some shooting, and uh, also uh, history and disassembly of the 76. The 76 copies this basic layout and pattern, but makes a number of changes to it. So if you're interested in the further evolution of this design, you should definitely check out the uh, Smith & Wesson M76 video. That'll be linked at the end of this. And uh, speaking of which, I think this is pretty much the end of this video. I'd like to once again thank Movie Arms Group for letting me come out, Movie Armament Group, letting me come up here and take a look at uh, their M45 guns, Swedish and Egyptian, and bring them to you guys. So hopefully you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching. Man, I, I like his videos a lot. Um, I knew there was some group in the U.S. military that used them consistently, that liked them. I uh, didn't realize that it was the SEALs. Obviously, I knew they were used in Vietnam. That's why initially, uh, you know, at, at the intro of the video, my head went to Cold War. Because that's really when I know of their use is during that era. So, um, yeah, but it's a it's a really cool it's a really cool piece. I am curious about two things. How heavy is it? And okay, three things. How heavy is it? Is the grip really that big? Or is it is it not? Is it his hands? I'm just curious because seriously, it looked massive in his hands. Um, and then three, the the magazine situation. Did they not end up using the older variation magazines? Did they not want to have that high round capacity? What's the reasoning behind moving away from that on the Swedish side? Um, but yeah, really great video. Let me know down in the comments what you all think of it. And as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. And I will see you all next time.